Um, so yeah, so here's the abstract. It's an interesting talk. It's not the kind of talk I'm used to giving, so it was uh, good that I wrote an abstract a while ago to remind myself what I was actually going to say. Um, but um, this, this is still a fairly accurate summary of what I'm going to say, although I will say very little really about the comparison to theory. I think that's going to be followed up more um, in, in some of the later talks anyway. Um, but I think maybe the, the first thing I should do is give you a brief introduction to the Large Hadron Collider on the assumption that several of you here are, are not familiar with it and not physicists. Um, so um, what I should say, you know, what we're doing with it and where the data is coming from that we're discussing. First of all, um, why we collide particles, what we mean by events, which is something, a word I'll be mentioning quite a lot. Um, what do we actually measure, which is kind of the meat of the talk, um, the final state of a collision event and, and how we define it. Um, and then where does it go, how, what lasts, this is the, the what lasts bit if you like, where, where's the information about what we actually did done, um, how do we try and ensure whether it's repeatable or not, what does that even mean when clearly no one's really going to build another Large Hadron Collider and check our results, so what are we actually doing there, are we storing enough? So the Large Hadron Collider, this, this is the picture um, that you would see. Um, if you were approaching Geneva Airport, which is on the back here, and if we'd actually painted the yellow stripe on the ground, which marks the um, path of the Large Hadron Collider, but it's a 27 kilometer long tunnel with counter circulating high energy proton beams, which are brought into collision at four points on the ring. Um, and at each one of those points, there's essentially a, a well, this is the highest tech digital camera we can. Um, we could build, designed to record what happens in those pictures. So CMS and ATLAS are the two general purpose detectors uh, where the Higgs boson was discovered. ATLAS is the one I work on. You have uh, members of the CMS collaboration here as well. And then ALICE and LHCB are more specialist um, experiments. Ed Edinburgh Physics are also um, major contributors to LHCB. Um, and, and essentially that at each point there, there is four collision points and protons are brought into head-on collision and we record what's, what happens when they collide, what particles are produced. Um, maybe it's worth saying why do we collide particles? Um, I have a little video for this, <laughs> but the, the bottom line is that high energy means short distance and what we're trying to do in particle physics is look at the structure of matter, the structure of nature, um, what are the fundamental constituents as far as we can tell of matter and how do they interact, what are the forces between them. And uh, sorry if this is a little noddy, but I thought for the, the beginning of the, uh, um, the start of the meeting it might be um, relaxing. Um, this is uh, my favourite video that I show um, to uh, try and explain the connection between um, resolution, distance and energy. So what you're going to see is a ripple tank um, in a minute. <laughs> Yes, so got to imagine this is the Atlas detector, this is the beam of particles and we're trying to resolve what's going on inside one proton with the other proton if you like. So someone will in a minute place a structure in the middle of, um, in the beam of, of protons and the impact that it makes on the screen here is what we would measure in Atlas. So this is a blob that's been placed here. You could tell from this screen that there's something there because there's a dead zone behind it. If you really did a careful analysis, you might be able to tell how big it is. If you're really lucky, you might be able to tell something about its shape. So one puts another one in, and now the waves have reformed. There's no sign of it at all. You wouldn't even know the blob was there. If you want to see the blob, the, the reason is that the wavelength here is bigger than the size of the blob, so you can't resolve it. If you crank up the energy and crank up, that shortens the wavelength, cranks up the resolution, now you can start seeing traces that the blob is present on the, on the atlas, in the atlas detector. You see the patterns in the waves. And again, with an analysis, you could work out some of the properties of this blob, at least the fact that it was there. So that's what we're doing, that's why we go to higher energy. Higher energy means short wavelength, and if you want to resolve structures, you need a wavelength at least as small, at least as short as the thing you want to see. So that's, that's what high energy physics is about, really, in a nutshell. And this is uh, another one of those PR slides, but this is um, where we are, sort of, in probing those distances. This axis here is given in distance in metres, but it could just as well be in energy. Um, what you see here is um, the probability of electrons um, scattering off uh, protons from the experiment that I used to work on in Hamburg. Um, and you see the when they exchange photons, it's the electromagnetic force. When they exchange W bosons, it's the weak force. 
as you go up and up in energy, which is going shorter and shorter distances, you see the two forces come together, you see a sort of unification in effect here. And physics, never, never wanting to give up on a good paradigm, thinks maybe everything will unify as we get to higher and higher energies, maybe the strong force will, maybe even gravity will come in. But this is actually measured. This is not, this, these are data, this is not theory, this is data. These forces do unify. This is connected to the origin of mass and the Higgs boson, and this is where the LHC was built to operate, so that's what it's doing. It's looking at shorter distances, higher energies than ever before. Amongst other things, to understand this unification, which also implies understanding the origin of mass, and that's where we are with the Higgs boson. So that's, I hope that's convinced you that it's uh, interesting to collide particles together. It's the only way to get that resolution. It's the only way we really know to study nature at these really short distance scales. Um, but of course, that implies a lot of um, there's a, certain, a lot of interpretation and, and, and measurement implied in that process in a collider um, or anything where you're smashing particles together. The underlying theory we're interested in is this very short distance thing, this business where the, where the th forces um, unify, for instance. But it will be embedded in a much more complex event. If you look at an atlas collision, there's particles everywhere. There's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Um, and that will include, you know, it's a collision between real particles, it will include a lot of physics that's already known but is being seen manifested in these collisions and a lot of lower energy physics as these particles progress, as they um, progress from the very short core of the collision and actually eventually impinge on our detectors. There's clearly a lot of physics involved there. This is the, um, the event, this is, this is one of the things we use to understand that and encode it is, is what we call Monte Carlo generators which are um, essentially coding up the very short distance physics and then the, all the stages of how that short distance physics ripples outwards through the production of the particles into the detector. And this is a graphical representation of a theory, a theory event, so a simulated event, um, but it also shows you how we conceptualise what's actually going on in these collisions. So you have a protons colliding here, um, they radiate all kinds of stuff as they approach, there's a hard core of the collision here and you see all these high energy particles being produced from it but there's a whole bunch of other stuff might be going on at the same time in the same proton-proton collision. These wiggly lines here and the straight lines are quarks and gluons. They're confined so they're not manifested in the detector. They don't detect, impinge on the detector directly. They turn into hadrons which are these green blobs here. Those hadrons are often unstable, they will decay and in the end these small blobs here are what actually will hit the detector and then you really start interpreting what your detector is telling you from that point on. So all this is going on in one of these collisions. So the event generator is what encodes the particle physics and the simulation then is how we try and understand our instrument. What, what are we actually seeing these, this, um, these particles with? So as I said, that previous picture was from an event generator called Sherpa, which is um, the head of that group is, is, is in Durham. And um, so that's not enough to, that only gets us to the final state particles of the collision. That's not enough to understand what we're seeing because obviously we're seeing this whole thing with an instrument, with a tool, which is the detector. So to understand what we're seeing, we also use a detector simulation as well as the particle physics simulation. So what a detector simulation is a detailed software model of, of our detector. There's a package called Jayon, which is used by particle physicists and medical physicists and all kinds of people to understand the kind of known and measured interactions of particles, high energy particles generally, with matter. So there's no new particle physics in there, there's no Higgs boson being discovered or something in there. It's how does an electron with a few MeV or GeV of energy interact when you smack it into some silicon or into some liquid argon or whatever it happens to be. And that's, that physics has been known, we can measure it in test beams, we can code it up using the principles that we understand. And we do that, we build a very then precise geometrical model um, with all this physics in it, the magnetic fields and stuff as well, um, of, of, the, um, of the detector and we propagate, we produce the particles from the theory model, the, the generator, the simulation of the, of the underlying particle physics and we propagate them step by step with an algorithm through the, the uh, detector simulation which includes bending them in the field and seeing how they lose energy as they pass through material and if they decay then we simulate the decay and so on. And then they've lost some energy in your detector model and you then simulate how you would read that energy out and that involves simulation which now is, is not so much physics, it's more it's electronics, it's more algorithmic 
but there are things like you have a, you might be measuring the energy on a scale of a digital scale of one to eight because you only have three bits to record it. So there's a there's a um, a granularity loss there, there's a resolution loss, there's a truncation if you have too much energy, all you can read out is the eighth bit, you can't, uh, is, is eight, you can't um, tell whether it was eight or more, the top one is eight or more. So there are things like that, saturation that would be, there are things like that, there's, there's often uh, a parallel readout for the trigger which is deciding whether you should save the whole event or just throw it away. Um, all those things can be simulated and here you're now on the on the border between is it really a simulation or are you just implementing what's actually happening in the detector, is it something you built? Because some of these things are algorithms that can actually be run on real data as well. But the goal of all that is to provide a, an input to the reconstruction programs then, which is as data. So the reconstruction program should be blind as to whether this came from the theory model or from the real collision. Or from the, real, the theory model of the particle physics and then the geometrical model, the software model of the detector can be replaced then by the real collision and the actual detector on the other side. But of course the key is that in the simulated case you have a, you retain a knowledge of what really happened, where really is what the theorists told you might have happened, um, but at least you, you can trace that mapping function from the beginning to the end. So here's a little graphical representation of that, this is that you have a Monte Carlo event generator which is your theory model, it will produce the four vectors, the energy and momenta of the particles, you pass it into your detector and trigger simulation, you get a digitised readout and you slap it into your event reconstruction and then you pass it off and it, to the physicist to work out what, what on earth was going on. And that maps on then to the real life situation which is the collider, the particles come out, they hit the detector, the readout is digitised and this bit is the same. Okay, and this bit is all replaced by the simulation. And of course what we're trying to do is invert this. So in this case everything's visible to us because we put this in in the first place, we coded it up ourselves. Um, so we can invert this process with some statistical technique, maybe a, a migration matrix inversion, all kinds of, a whole, you could have a whole other day discussing how you do this thing and how well it's done. But that's, that's the goal, is to get back from what we saw to what we think happened in the short distance physics in the middle of the detector. Um, and we can check that in this case because we know what actually happened and of course in the real, in real life, in the real data, we don't know what happened here, we have to rely on this being correct. Okay, so what do we actually measure? Well, we measure the final state, quantum mechanics tells us that, so no matter what, what are you thinking um, happened in the middle of your Feynman diagram, you're not allowed to measure that directly, you're measuring what was really, what really hit the detector in the end. We can't in, even in principle tell the difference between quantum mechanical amplitudes. So we have to be careful when we define our measurements to define them in terms of real final states. For a given value of real, he says in the philosophy department. Um, so physically define the final states, what I mean by that uh, is long lived particles that if you kind of, your red arrow gets you back to them then you're minimising the model dependence and you're maximising the physical meaning of what you've done. So you're, you're trying to reduce the dependence on your detector while not increasing the dependence on the theory model that you put in at the beginning. So I think it's, it's pretty widely agreed that, uh, that at least the first stage of a measurement or a search should be statable in terms of truth final state particles, so real hadrons, real electrons, real muons, that kind of thing. And if that's not true, and it's not always true, then one should ask why. Uh, and the chances are if you can't state your measurement in terms of real particles then it, it's not really fair to call it a measurement. So just to go through, that sounds maybe too obvious to even bother saying, but it's not. Um, you have to argue about what is a final state. Are quarks and gluons a final state? Well, no, because they're confined, you never see them hit the detector. On the other hand, very often the top quark is treated as a final state particle effectively and that, that brings with it its own problems because it leads to an ambiguity in what you mean by the mass of the top quark, for instance. WZ Higgs bosons, they're fairly well defined things but they're definitely not final state particles. They decay in order 10 to the minus 24 seconds and they will have, in general, any diagram that involves a Z in it will probably have an interference term with a photon in it as well, for instance, so you, you can't really um, treat them as final state particles. Tau leptons, they decay pretty quickly but they actually travel a few hundred microns so you can actually tell that there was one there, so it, depending on the measurement it makes some sense to treat them as final state, although they don't actually hit the detector, the decay products do, but the, but the decay is measurable because you can see the displaced vertex, so you don't have, I mean they, they are physically well defined at some level. 
Hadrons in general, well, some of them decay super quickly, some of them live for a lot longer. Um, you make a lifetime cut, maybe. Do they propagate into the detector itself? Some of them do. Long-lived kaons will travel through the detector. Pi zero will decay way before it even gets out of the beam pipe. So you need to make a, a lifetime cut or something in practice. We tend to measure the best analogue to quarks and gluons is a hadronic jet, which is a collimated spray of particles that sort of reflects the direction that the quark or the gluon was going in. We can reconstruct those with algorithms and define them clearly with algorithms, but that doesn't evade the question as to what did you put into the algorithm as the input? What was it clustering in the first place? Was it quarks and gluons? Was it hadrons? Was it calorimeter energy deposits or charged particle tracks that you measured? Neutrinos we don't see at all, but we, we can um, we can measure missing energy where a neutrino would have been and we can deal with that somehow. Photons we can see, but photons can be produced right in the short distance physics or they can be produced from decays of hadrons and you maybe want to treat them differently. And electrons and muons, they radiate photons. Do you include those photons with the electron or do you separate them? So I'm, just, I'm not expecting answers to these, I'm just trying to give you a flavour of saying measure the final state is not as simple as it sounds. You have to discuss quite carefully what it is that you're treating as the final state particles. Just as an example, this is an interesting diagram that actually Corinne worked on, I think, <laughs> some of the time. Um, the, uh, this is a quark and an antiquark annihilating to give you a photon and then a, a Z photon propagator here, which is an example of, they would interfere with each other, that's an example of why you can't treat the Z as a real particle. But you might have a, an effective vertex here that you want to test. Um, there may be some interesting physics going on here. But this diagram here has the identical final state, but it doesn't have any photon-photon vertex because this photon's come off this line here. So if you want to treat this, you, you would, could argue with yourself whether this is a Z plus photon event or is it just a, a, um, a Z event with a photon radiate with, with this photon being included in this lepton, for instance? And all of these things, you, the, you have to make a kinematic choice. You can't just, you cannot measure these diagrams. You can't distinguish these diagrams based on the final state. All you can do is choose a kinematic region where this one or this one may dominate, for instance. So a common uh, choice, for instance, is to place a lifetime cut at 10 picoseconds. Um, and draw the lines at hadronization and things, but I mean it's not really the topic of here. So, so that, that part of the argument is about, even if you take it as a given that we must measure the final state, we cannot try and measure quantum mechanical amplitudes because that's just unphysical. It's still, there's still a lot of discussion you can have about exactly how you define the final state. Um, the other issue that I want to cover is this business of fiducial cross-sections, which is a bit of a big, a bit of a buzzword. Um, but this is to do with, and this is a, a very common trap that, that physicists have fallen into, and experimentalists mislead theorists by pretending to measure things they haven't done. Um, there's a difference between correcting for efficiency or unfolding, which is that red arrow on my cartoon before, where you, you're going from the digitizations in the detector to what you think gave rise to them. Um, there's a difference between that and acceptance corrections. The first two of them are things that we can control with that detector model. So we, we have a, we, that whole diagram, the three blocks diagram that I gave you, gives us control of unfolding and efficiency corrections. Um, and no one but us can do that because you need the full detector model to do that. But the third one, acceptance corrections, means trying to compensate for the fact that your detector doesn't measure everything, it doesn't cover the whole of phase space. Um, extrapolating into kinematic regions which haven't been measured at all, in fact, and that's a whole different kettle of fish. Um, we have to be very careful of it. Sometimes it's justifiable, um, for instance, if there's a good symmetry, if you're measuring a fi around the beam where you know that physics is symmetric or you're prepared to assume that it is, and you have a gap of a few degrees, then extrapolating over that gap probably isn't going to do any harm. <coughs> On the other hand, extrapolating to low momentum or the forward direction is very, going to be very dangerous because the physics isn't very well known there. Just to give you an idea what I mean, um, they say this is a measurement, we're trying, to, we're trying to measure some bit of phase space, what went on is some bit of phase space from a collision. So we unfold to sharpen up the image and we can see what was going on. We want to get a fuller picture of the event, we can increase our acceptance, so we do so. And we want to get an even bigger idea of what's going on, we increase our acceptance a bit further. But then we run out, we can't build a detector here, maybe it's too close to the beam line or something, so we can't measure what's going on here. So, well, we got a pretty good idea what's going on, so we'll extrapolate. 
and then you go, you've got a full, we measured the total cross section for, I don't know, leaf production at the LHC. It's, um, it's all been done. Um, but the question is, the thing is, while the unfolding here was controlled by our detector model, this is, is actually just theory. This is just input from the theory. So you have to ask yourself how reliable that is. Sometimes, as I say, it may be very reliable because the symmetry tells you it should be right. Other times it's a completely new kinematic region and it could hold surprises. So, <laughs> um, I don't know what's on her face, but never mind. Um, and the, the point is that you, you really should not be claiming to measure bits of phase space that you haven't really measured because you could, it can be very, if you're searching for new physics, the new physics might be in the bit that you've just kind of smeared over with the theory. So the, that leads to the concept of a fiducial cross-section, where you define a region where the acceptance is about 100%. Um, and that implies that the theory has to then calculate, incorporate your kinematic cuts into the theory you're going to calculate, uh, you're going to compare to. Um, and it's easy to do in, in some theories, and it's very difficult in others, which is why you've seen that kind of extrapolation done. It's often because the theory can only calculate the whole thing, it can't calculate the region you've actually measured. So what you do is say, this is, the, this is what we measured, this is inaccessible, and we move it by kinematic cuts, it's not part of the fiducial cross-section, the theory has to calculate that bit, I'm afraid, and we can't make any assumption about what's going on in here. Ideally, of course, you build an experiment that covers the whole phase space of interest, and then you sharpen it up and you see what's going on, and that's all controlled then by the models, but if you're just extrapolating, you're running a very high risk, and in the end, you're fooling yourselves. Um, just to give you, this is not all um, hypothetical, um, this is actually what set me off on it, in fact Michael might remember this, this data. <laughs> this is um, from, the, uh, from uh, 93, 1993 when I was a postdoc at, in Hamburg and we were measuring the um, production of charm quarks in electron proton collisions at HERA in, in Hamburg. And um, the, the ex this, this is the, allegedly the total cross-section for production of charm as a function of energy. You can see the previous experiments data here. Here's our data up here. Clearly an important measurement to make. Huge lever arm. Does this theory still work when you go to these really high energies that no one's ever had access to before? Um, unfortunately, we got all that lever arm, but you see that the, the theory uncertainties, the, the experimental uncertainties are large, but the theory uncertainties as well, once you put them both together, they're huge. And unfortunately, they kind of span the, the uncertainty in the prediction, sort of seems to very, very unfortunately be about the same as the uncertainty in the data. And that's not a coincidence, because they're the same thing. Because the acceptance for this measurement is actually about 1.4%, and it's actually zero for a huge bit of phase space, the bit where my daughter was hiding, just not measured at all. And that's where most of the theory uncertainty is. And so you're just putting garbage in and getting garbage out here. The actual measurement is having a very small influence on where these data points are, and no influence on what size the error bars are. Now, to be fair, on my previous experiment, they've done what I said they should do, and there's a pre uh, the measurement, there is a fiducial measurement in there that says this is what we actually saw, but the, the kind of theory they can compare to at that time wasn't very sophisticated, so they did this too, but it really gave them no extra information because the, theory, the uncertainties in their extrapolation are so large that you don't gain any, um, any you're really not putting anything else in, you're just using the theory to, to compare to the theory in the end. And this is happening still on, on Atlas if, if we're careful, if we're not careful. Um, for instance, we, we claim to measure the total production for a pair of cross section for a pair of W bosons. Um, the detector corrections are about 60 to 30 percent um, on that. That's the sharpening up of the image, if you like. Um, but then if you extrapolate to the total cross section, you're having to make 90% or so corrections, and that's all theory input. It's just, it's just theory. And given that we're in a, a new kinematic regime above the electroweak symmetry breaking scale for the first time, that's, that's indefensible, really. So again, to be fair to Atlas, we put this in because people want to see it, but this is the main result, and we have the fiducial cross-section in as well. We're missing 90% of stuff we just haven't seen. And the, the, one of the motivations for this, certainly from an experimentalist point of view, where you've gone to a lot of effort to build a detector, is that the efficiency uh, and the detector corrections, the unfolding and things, they won't change much as you go to, as you, um, go up to higher energies, but the acceptance will drop further because the, the phase space is opening up wider. Um, no, I'm not going to go through that. I didn't, that's another example. Um, 
I think I deleted the wrong slide from my talk there. I didn't mean to show, show the, um, the top cross-section. But what I was going to say is that the, the key point about this fiducial cross-section, let's just go back to here. The key point from an experimentalist point of view about the fiducial cross-sections is that the bit, the red arrow, the unfolding back, is something that only we can do. Once the collaboration is disbanded and the experiment has been pulled to pieces and things, then it's very unlikely that any, no one will ever have that level of understanding of the measurement again. So that's got to be done well, it's got to be documented properly. If you do that, the unfolding back of the arrow, and you build in the theory extrapolation at the same time, and then the theory suddenly changes because we found a new particle or we just got better at calculating things, then your data is, is now not no use anymore because it's out of date, because the theory has a shelf life, um, whereas a fiducial cross-section should, should, is supposed to be an objective measurement of what actually happens when you collide protons with minimal theory input. So there's a, it's a way of this minimizing model dependence. It's clearly good, I guess, from a philosophical and, and um, a, a scientific point of view anyway, but it's also vital because the theory re indeed does change either in terms of getting better understanding and more precision or finding things that we didn't expect. Um, so there's a very strong motivation for, for having the minimal model dependent fiducial cross-section of a final state as well as maybe some of the fancy interpretations in terms of extra gauge couplings and stuff. Okay. So final section then, that, that's, that's my kind of summary of what we, what we at least what we're tempt, attempting to do when we make these measurements and of course all of these points have um, error bars on them associated with how well you, how confident you are about that red arrow, how confident you are that you've unfolded back to something that approximates the truth that what actually happened in the, the collision. The next question, I guess, is where does that go, and can it be recovered, and can it be used effectively? So, obviously, the major academic output is, is published papers. Um, if you look at a paper, typically it, they vary hugely, but they'll have you know a few order order one to order a thousand typically data points in them with uncertainties, often with correlations between those uncertainties and things now. So you can actually use them. People use them for theory fits of, say, supersymmetric models or pattern densities to try and extract the, the quark and gluon quant content of the proton. Um, the paper also, there's an element of um, trying to make people read your paper, so there will be a physics headline in there saying, you know, what have we really learned? In the, and often that bit, the physics headline, is going to be in terms of whatever the particular theory of the day is. So if you say we, we, we're looking for extra dimensions and we've excluded them up to this extra limit that no one had ever done before, or if you're really lucky, we've found them. Um, or, you know, we were testing the, the standard model predictions for this process in a new energy regime, and here it is. And, and so that, that discussion is obviously um, going to be in terms of a theory because that's how we encode our, our current understanding of what, what's going on. Um, and then a paper will often com come with auxiliary material, um, large data tables, often with more points, more information on the uncertainties and the correlations than you could get in your four-page PRL, for instance, um, and, off and in electronic form so they can be readily analysed. So that's, that's not too bad, um, although very often you'll find that the paper really doesn't give you enough information to actually work out what was going on. Um, certainly a typical LHC paper will not give you enough information or money to allow you to go and rebuild Atlas and the LHC. So that part of reproducibility is not really appropriate in this case. But what you would like is to know the algorithmic approach, what was the final state that was actually measured and how was it interpreted in terms of the theory, because that's the bit you can actually do again. The interpretation should be redoable as many times as you want, even if you can't redo the measurement. So there are other places it goes, um, uh, at the IPPP in Durham, there's, there, there's a HEP data database and there's this um, program called Rivet, um, which, uh, so HEP data will contain electronic data tables and things, very easy to an analyse, saves you typing out and lots of copying out data from tables, from papers. And then Rivet is, is, um, an encode, is a, a software library that encodes the detailed analysis as if the detector were perfect. So it doesn't deal with the red arrow, it says let's assume that within the error bars that the experimentalists quote and with the correlations and things that they quote, um, they've done the job right because we can't redo that again. Now let's um, see, let, how do I, um, this may, that, what they've done will maybe a very complex bit of phase space because it'll be fiducial, it'll be defined in some specific definition of a final state. Um, it may have particular algorithms run on it, event shapes and jet finders and all kinds of stuff. 
Um, so Rivet will provide an encoding of all, the, all that part of the, the analysis so that you can take a, an, a, you can make a prediction of a final state of a proton-proton collision and see and compare it directly to the measurement um, that has been made within the fiducial region. So that's, that works, that's used a, a lot by, by certainly by, well, all, all four of the LHC experiments now and it also has Tevatron and some HERA and LEP data in there as well from the previous generations. Um, so that, that's a, a model that seems to work for, for a number of applications. But it doesn't have everything in. It doesn't tell you how the unfolding was done. Um, for instance, that, how that red arrow, the interpretation of the detector model was done. It's of course possible that mistakes are made during that. Um, there are internal notes in the collaboration, which is the thing we use in our reviews, our internal reviews before we let the data go out. They're varying quality, but they're usually quite thorough. thorough. They often read like a bit of a ba brain dump. Someone's just put all the, all the plots they made into a paper, but, you, but the information is kind of there if you, if you need it. The big drawback with them, of course, is they're not public. They're internal to the collaboration. Um, whether they will ever be made public as the collaborations go is something actually we should probably discuss because I think having you know, a year later releasing the internal note is probably not a daft thing to do. Um, but that would be controversial. Um, and then of course, talking about data persistency in general, um, the raw data, three or four petabytes per year or something from the, the LHC, um, is stored at CERN but it's not typically public. And if you wanted to make any sense of it at all, uh, it would require complex code. Um, the latest estimate I could find was 5 million lines of C++, and there's another million or two of Python as well by now, and that's only the central code, not the stuff that the PhD students and postdocs are actually using to make the plots. Um, and all that's needed to make sense of it. Um, and it's not the true final state, it's not the result of the unfolding, it's the, it's the digitized readout from the detector completely raw. So it needs a lot of work before you can actually understand it at all. Um, so what about the output of my three boxes at the end, the reconstructed data? That is the closest to it. What you'd really like, right, is to s store somewhere Atlas's best estimate of the final state. So choose some complicated definition of the final state according to that list that I, that I uh, showed earlier on. A correct for all the detective effects and produce a list of hadrons and electrons and muons and things with systematic errors and put them out and let people play with them and that's very much what um, a large astronomy um, experiment does. Right? So the European Southern Observatory has data formats defined that they have to release their data in after a certain period. It's also true of, thing of, of uh, NASA and ESA space missions. Um, and and there's, what they're doing there is, is understood enough that they, that they can release the data in a format that other scientists can, can uh, analyze it and in fact you often see now on the on the archive um, competing analysis one from the people who built the uh, telescope and another one from people who read the data that they released publicly and it's, it's it's good for science that that happens we would like to do that with the large hadron collider data but the problem is somewhat more complex in that you have thousands of particles per event and we don't even measure those thousands of particles we tend to measure um, a, a cross section in a phase space after some clustering algorithm so I think that the will is kind of there to do this, but it's not, um, it's not as simple as it is with, um, with say, a, a, an observatory. Which is not to say that's simple, but it's certainly simpler than this. Um, so if we, ideally we'd re release the reconstructed data, it's closest to the final state, you could reanalyze it according to your favorite kinematics and, and cross-section cuts. Um, all the experiments have released some of this, um, but mainly for educational purposes. CMS released their data already from 2010, which is quite a small and quite a simple data set, um, but is in principle available for analysis. But if you go to the website, which is here, where you'll see all this stuff, um, you, the first thing you have to do is install a massive virtual machine for scientific Linux. Uh, you have to install Root, um, you have to, which is a software analysis tool that particle physicists are stuck with, um, and lots of other auxiliary software as well, before you even start looking at the data. Um, so it's not easy. Um, so I guess that I seem to have gone through this way too, way faster than I expected. Is that all right? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> probably means I was rushing. I hope you could understand. Um, so in summary, I guess I'd say I, I hope I've given you a flavour of the challenges of defining what we mean by a measurement in a way that it can be reanalyzed by other people. Um, I think ease of access to and reproducibility of published measurements 
as we're in a much better situation with the LHC than we were with the previous generation of experiments, and that's definitely true. And that's down to things like you know being being stricter about fiducial regions and definitions and, and packages like HEP data and Rivet and things. Um, Genuine open access to genuinely reanalyzable data is still very challenging. I'd say the first tentative steps have been made with the LHC. I should have mentioned actually there is a data set from, from um, the previous generation of electron positron colliders which are much simpler, lower multiplicity of particles, um, a lot less theoretical uncertainty associated with it and a much smaller data set that is is public, has been reanalyzed several times, and in particular the strong coupling constant has been measured from data that's 30, 40 years old because the theoretical tools for doing that improved and the data was reanalyzable using the new tools because it had been saved in a, in a format that was accessible and that really did lead to genuine physics benefit and that we measured alpha s better because of that using 20 years of theoretical um, improvement in calculations and understanding um, and having had the data measured in a model independent and, and accessible way and stored. And, that, and so there's a, re there's a real win in these if you can do it right. Doing that with the LHC data is what we would all like to do, I think, but it's, it's, very, it's more challenging because of the sheer size of the data set and, and the complexity of the events. So it's challenging, but it has progressed. And there's a nice little summary that I was actually reading uh, just yesterday on the train um, about how this is going on with some discussions of, of, of what's... Um, what's happening in particle physics compared to what's been happening in astronomy and in other, other areas of science as well. So I just thought I'd stick the reference for that up there. Okay, so over to discussion. <laughs>